Though Japan is nothing but an island in the world, a benevolent rule has been conducted since the Emperor Jimmu founded the country. No other foreign country can compare with Japan in terms of the abundance of grains grown. Therefore, there is none among those Japanese who were wrecked abroad and drifted to a foreign country that did not yearn for their native traditions and to return home. Manjiro and the other Japanese castaways were washed upon an uninhabited island in the year of the Ox of Tempo. They journeyed to the Sandwich Islands, North America and other foreign lands, suffering many hardships and toiling day and night. For more than 10 years, they attempted to return to Japan and finally fulfilled their wish in the year of the Rat of Kai. They are indeed what I call people who yearn after the country and its origins. In the twelfth year of Tempo, the year of the ox, five fishermen set out to fish in the nearby sea. Four of the young Japanese men were from Nishihama. The fifth, Manjiro, 15, was from Nakanohama village in Hata County. They borrowed a small boat about 24 feet long and loaded it with one and a half bushels of rice, firewood, water and kindling. Sailing from Usuura Harbour at about 10 in the morning of the 5th day of January, they headed west. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, the wind shifted. The clouds moved swiftly overhead. Seeing this, the other boats quickly unfurled their sails and headed toward Nunozaki. Fudinojo ordered the crew to haul in the fishing gear and set sail for land, about 18 miles away. Working together, they raced towards land. As the sun set, waves splashed and sprayed all around them, making it impossible to see ahead. Then a northeasterly wind rose and the two currents fought against each other, threatening to overturn the boat several times. Soon the situation grew desperate as the oar lock for the sculling oar broke off. Exhausted, overwhelmed with fatigue, they were at a loss. Though everyone was devoted to his duty, the wind became stronger and the temperatures grew colder. They were freezing, and only Fudenojo held the helm. The boat was swept swiftly, like an arrow, in a southeast direction. They drifted into the night. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV, the documentary streaming service. So, as we all know, Coco is the world's biggest Japan nerd. She loves Japan and is absolutely devastated she can't visit this year. She loves sushi, she loves omenomiyaki, she loves... She loves eating the Christmas tree. So, if you're feeling claustrophobic like me and Coco, Japan from Above in 4K is the documentary for you. A beautiful journey around the land of the rising sun, replete with lots of incredible vistas. And at the moment, Magellan has an amazing two-for-one gift card deal. So there really isn't a better time to try out and share the more than 3,000 documentaries Magellan offers. Click on the link in the description for an exclusive month-long free trial for Voices of the Past viewers, and also to get involved in the great two-for-one gift card deal. Thanks. On the early morning of the 10th, the winds shifted in their favour and rain began to fall. They covered their boat with rush matting, split wood, prepared some gruel and ate it with fish. Then the rain turned to sleet and they gathered it in their palms, satisfying their thirst. Around noon on the 13th day, they caught a dim view of a small island in the southeast direction. Their provisions exhausted, they were unbearably hungry and thirsty. They felt hopeless. If what they saw ahead was truly an island, they would go ashore to obtain water, take an ample sip, and willingly throw themselves into the sea to end their misery. Once everyone was ashore, some of the men walked around the island to find its shape. It was a large, craggy island about two and a half miles in diameter. A cave gaped nearby. The castaways crept in on their bellies to find the cave was about nine by fifteen feet square. 
The hungry crew ate some birds and took shelter in the cave. One day, while Manjiro was gathering shellfish on the shore, he saw two boats being lowered from a foreign ship and heading for the island with sails unfurled. He cried out to his mates, Rescuers, rescuers, the rescue boats are coming. Hearing this, Toraemon and Gomon ran forward and tied Gomon's trousers to a broken sail yard, holding them up as a distress signal. The crewmen raised their hats in response. As they approached the ship and looked up, Fudinojo and the others were aghast, bewildered by this sudden rescue and halfway between sleeping and waking. The ship was about 30 ken long and 6 ken wide, with three masts and eight small boats on deck. They were brought inside the ship to the captain's quarters. Here they saw a row of rooms furnished gorgeously enough to serve as a small shrine for Buddha. The rooms looked so dignified that the castaways were awed and could hardly approach them. They knelt in fear before the captain and his mates. The captain told Fudinojo and the others to come close and said something incomprehensible. Imagining they were being asked what nationality they were, they answered, Nihonjin, Nihonjin. Taking pity on their cold and hunger, the captain took out five suits of dry clothes and showed them by gestures how to wear them. The cook brought them some steamed sweet potatoes, which the captain disapproved of. Perhaps he thought it was unwise for the five men to suddenly eat a lot of food. He took back their food and gave them bowls of herb soup and a little pork. Thereafter, the captain gave them solid food gradually. For lunch, the crew seemed to eat another kind of food, while the men were served good rice, the captain perhaps guessing they were Japanese. They appreciated the captain's consideration and enjoyed the meals. The big ship was a whale ship from New Bedford, Massachusetts, from the United States in North America. On board were 6,000 oil barrels, several cows and hogs, grain, two cannons and 30 bayonets. It was manned by 34 men and was called the John James Howland. The captain was William H. Whitfield, a native of Fairhaven, a town bordering New Bedford. He was about 40 years old, fair of skin, jet black hair trimmed and combed straight back. He was wearing a jacket and what looked like a close-fitting coat called trousers or pantaloons. He was nearly six feet tall and looked like a nobleman. Though Fudinojo and the others didn't know what would become of them after being saved by the foreigners, they were relieved that now they were being kept alive and their means of returning home would present itself in due course. One day in November, the ship entered a port at Oahu, one of the Sandwich Islands. After Fudinojo and the others settled down, Captain Whitfield had five jackets and five pairs of trousers made for them, and gave them five half dollars each. The ship's company also gave them five overcoats. The captain told Fudinojo and the others that now they had settled down, they must live in peace. Then he asked for Fudinojo's permission to take Manjiro to America and educate him. He thought that the boy learned quickly and showed great promise. He said he would treat Manjiro well. Fudinojo was dismayed with the idea that after drifting to such a distant foreign land they might have to live separately against their wishes. He didn't want them to be separated. They'd been through so much adversity together. On the other hand, Captain Whitfield was very kind and had saved their lives. As the request grew out of the affection and admiration the captain felt for the boy, the decision rested with Manjiro. Fudinojo gave his permission. This pleased Captain Whitfield very much. He took Manjiro with him and returned to the ship. In November, the twelfth year of Tempo, the year of the ox, Manjiro parted from Fudinojo and the others and accompanied Captain Whitfield on his travels at sea. He was called John Mung, or Mung for short, and he became part of the crew.
In early December, they set sail from Oahu and headed south. They came upon the volcanic island called Hurricane Island, where the castaways had experienced such hardships together. The men fished for small fish near the island and then caught some whales in waters about 120 to 250 miles off Japan. By late April, in the 14th year of Tempo, the year of the hare, they had sailed to within 250 miles of Cape Horn, the southern tip of South America. The sea turned icy, and numerous large icebergs towered high around them. They passed the highest and largest one, which measured over 1,000 feet and appeared to topple over. A strange ocean animal the size of a large bull was found here, and was known as a sea horse. Seals passed by here too, odd and colourful, with dark red backs and horns at the top of their muzzles, all heading northeast. The men also saw a strange star, called a comet, that filled the western sky. It was said to appear every 80 to 100 years. The ship headed due north-northwest, and it reached the entrance of New Bedford Harbour in early June. New Bedford was located in the province of Massachusetts in the United States in North America. The city's harbour was more than six miles long, and its entrance at its narrowest was over two miles wide. After informing the owner of the ship's return, Captain Whitfield parted from the crew. Taking Manjiro with him, he crossed the bridge to the south side and arrived in the village of Fairhaven, which was second to New Bedford in number of streets, thoroughfares and houses. Captain Whitfield's house was located in the middle of town. When he reached home, the front door was tightly shut and the house looked desolated and dilapidated. Very worried, he knocked at the house next door and asked why his house looked abandoned. Captain Whitfield learned that his wife had died while he was at sea and that because there was no other family members to occupy it, the house was closed up. Devastated, he took Manjiro to the home of James Allen, a carpenter, who gave Manjiro lodging. The country of the United States was more than 6,930 ri from east to west, and more than 4,100 from north to south. It was divided into more than 30 provinces. Because the country was located at 40 to 50 degrees north latitude, the air was clean, and the temperature was seasonable and a variety of grains grew there. The natives were extremely lovely in appearance, with fair skin and dark hair. They were more than five or six feet tall. Kind and gentle by nature, both affectionate and compassionate, they thought highly of morality and fidelity, and were always diligent and industrious in everything, including trading far and wide. Needless to say, the women were lovely, and bundled their dark hair at the crown. They were never seen wearing ornamental hairpins. Their nature was obedient, and it had become the custom of the country for women to be highly virtuous. There were all sorts of people, including those with dark skin, red hair, and a slightly different disposition, probably the results of the blending of different races. Food, clothes, houses, and tools were the same as in Oahu, but Oahu could not compare with Fairhaven in terms of opulence. As in Oahu, people disdained liquor, but those who were idle and permissive would indulge. These people were especially avoided, as nobody dared approach them. Manjiro was now boarded in the house of James Allen for several days. Allen's daughter Jane, who was over 30, taught a number of children at an elementary school in the neighbourhood. Miss Allen told Manjiro that if he wanted to learn how to write, she would teach him, and bought him a copybook. So he studied earnestly. Meanwhile, Captain Whitfield visited a city called New York, in the province of New York, located 250 miles from Fairhaven. It was the seat of administration for more than 30 provinces. For their government, people elected a man of wisdom and learning for president who held office for four years. However, if the man were highly virtuous and enlightened, and governed the people eminently, they allowed him to remain in office. The income per year for the president was 1,200 silver pieces, 
A silver coin is equivalent to Japanese two kan, 500 mon. Men of talent assembled in the capital from far and wide and competed to be elected to the office. The current president is called Taylor. He was said to be just in administering punishment, justice and law. Because the country was governed in such a way, the people would say the United States was better than any other in the world. Manjiro was ready for his next adventure. He had heard that in a United States province called California, a great gold mine was located within the limits of Sacramento. People who went there from other provinces were at liberty to dig for gold. If he went to California to be a digger, Manjiro thought he would surely get hold of extraordinary wealth and would then be free to do as he pleased. Perhaps he could earn his passage to Japan, which was his dream. Taking his old acquaintance Terry with him, they took passage on a ship anchored in Fairhaven called Stieglitz, which was 130 feet in length. In May, they reached California and docked in San Francisco, which was an important resting place for trading vessels. The thriving city was located on the hills behind the bay, and over 3,000 closely packed houses lined the streets. The two companies put up at a hotel for three days and took passage on a strange ship called a steamboat. That night, they journeyed up a big river for more than 260 miles and reached Sacramento. After landing, they saw many strange vehicles called railroads. There were very many such vehicles in the United States. Mangiero said that he had ridden one before. The railroad ran on coal. An 18 square foot iron box enclosed a strong coal fire and the accumulated steam was released through an iron pipe. The steam turned the wheels and propelled the massive vehicle at high speed, turning exactly the same way as the wheels of a steamboat. People settled in a box, put their possessions on the rack above and sat beneath. They could look at scenery out the windows, three on the right side, three on the left, all fitted with glass. If you looked out the windows, all things slanted sideways, and it ran so fast that nothing remained in sight for long. It was a rare sight. The railroad's path lay where there were no mountains, and iron rods were laid on the ground without a break for hundreds of miles so that the railroad could run over them. Hiking for five days, they climbed a high mountain half covered with snow, called Sierra Nevada. When they arrived, they immediately went to work. Manjiro was employed during the day by the gold agency as a miner and was given digging tools. A large pit was excavated and the miners dug there for gold. However, because it was summer and unbearably hot in the pit, the miners would dig about four feet along the riverbank. Gold dust was mixed in the earth and it could be separated from the sand by washing it in river water. There was said to be a secret to the process. Besides gold, the miners dug for several other metals, such as silver, copper, lead, and tin. Because of the abundance of gold, the North River area had become increasingly more wealthy. The place was so prosperous that evil became a product too. Many people organized in gangs and called themselves vigilantes. Under the pretext of helping the weak, they cheated people out of their money and in extreme cases killed them with guns. A great many men were so violent and wayward that the place was ungovernable. After working for 30 days, Manjiro and his friend received $180 in wages. With the money, they quit the agency and bought their own digging equipment. Manjiro earned more than $600 in 70 days, an enormous sum of money. He thought it would be indecent to continue. He decided to finish up and go to Oahu, where he would reconnect with his friends, take passage on a ship, and return home to Japan. Their ship reached the great harbor of Nagasaki on September the 29th. On the morning of October the 1st, they landed and were taken to the courtyard of the magistrate's office to be interrogated by the authorities. 
Among the implements the castaways had brought back with them was a world map, which Manjiro used to explain where they had been, what the different places were like, and other facts about the world. Finally, the examination was concluded. They were sentenced to three days of imprisonment. Later, they were given Japanese clothes, and for the first time, their foreheads were shaved in Japanese style. On September the 24th, the examination was finally over. The three men were forbidden to have any occupation related to the sea, but were compensated with a lifelong stipend and given permission to return to their home village. Denzo's house had crumbled and nobody could tell where its exact location was. Manjiro arrived in Nakanohama on the afternoon of the 5th to find that his old mother was still alive. He greeted his elder brother-in-law, and he was greeted by Seki, Shin, and Tokizo, and his younger brother and sister, Kamikichi and Ume. They all drank in celebration and shed tears on hearing his story of hardships. The world map that Manjiro had brought back had been carefully selected by an Englishman, newly drawn in 1844 of the Christian era, the third year of Koka. No maps the Japanese used could compare with it in minuteness and perfection. However, because the names of the places had been copied in English and were very difficult to read, the authorities had Manjiro translate the English words into Japanese for official use. By an official consideration, Manjiro was made a hereditary retainer to the Lord, and he gratefully received the favour of his country.